come invite your friends. She's going to be leading it. So, so I bought uh, 10 books, so that's how many I have. It's um, The format is, I'm just kind of um, facilitating, not really teaching. There's a video series. It's a lady named Lisa Turkhurst, who's an amazing Bible teacher. She teaches women's topics. And there's this one called Trustworthy, and it's about learning to trust God and through the tough times that we go through. Mm -hmm. So... Um, We'll watch a video a video teaching, and then we all will have a lot of homework to do in our book before we come together again, and then we'll have discussion and watch another video teaching. So like I said, I'm just kind of facilitating it, and it's uh, for everybody, all the women, to participate and bring back what you've studied. All right, it would be interesting coming. All you guys are interested. All right, I'm gonna hold you to it, Al. <laughs> you don't have a wig on it. <laughs> All right, ladies. All right. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Lisa, what's hi. I'll get back to you. I'm thinking uh, what I would like to do is just every other Friday night, because then we have family get togethers on Friday nights sometimes. So every other Friday night at, what time did we say, Jennifer? Six o'clock? From six to eight. Six thirty to eight. Six thirty to eight o'clock. Just no sweets though, right? No sweets down here? <laughs> so the format is going to be come together, get right into the study, and then finish on time, and then if, or whoever wants to stay and socialize, we can do that afterward, because we have some people who are going to need to leave as soon as it's over, and so, yeah. That's it. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Every time I have one of these messages, God always, always fills the house. Amen. And I never say anything because it's like one of those, I was like, God, this is going to be another one of those, watch, where we, we couldn't just have one person show up just to hear this <laughs> message and be a lot easier, but instead you just fill the house. So, okay. Yeah. But my prayer all day has been that I would preach for him and not for you. That's the greatest thing that I can do as a servant of the Most High God. Is preach for him and not for you. Amen. 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 So I know we've prayed a bunch, but prayer is the greatest thing we have. Let's pray again. My God, I need your power. I need your spirit. Take all fleshliness away from this pulpit, my God. Take all fleshliness from this house. Yes. Lord, this is such an amazing thing that we're going to hear tonight, but I know first, God, we've got to break, break the hard ground first. Thank you, Father, for preparing the heart of everybody, and thank you, Father, for leading me, for filling me with your spirit, and thank you for your word, my God. I praise you, and I thank you that you are faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So something that I'm always encouraged to read before I ever come up, regardless of the severity of the message, I'm always encouraged to read to myself James chapter 3, verse 17, which says, The wisdom that is from above. The wisdom that is from above. Who do you think the above and wisdom? That's God, right? Mm -hmm. the, his wisdom, the wisdom that is from above, it's first pure, and then it's peaceable, and then it's gentle. It's easy to be received. It's full of mercy and good fruits, without favoritism, without hypocrisy. Verse 18 says, And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that so I'm always encouraged to read that anytime I come up here to speak before you so I get my bearings right. So I make sure mm -hmm. you're God's precious children. I love you very much and I want to share God's truth with you. And God's truth is hard at some times. Sometimes it's easier. But guys, like the prophet Jeremiah said, isn't the word of the Lord like a fire, like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Amen. 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 Tonight's message is called The Judgment and Love of God. The Judgment of God and the Love of God. So I had a dream, and the people that were in this dream didn't know that they were in this dream, but now I'm going to share it with you now. So I had a dream. I was at work, 
and there was an active shooter. Everybody in this room is familiar with people going into buildings and shooting out places, right? That's, that's, no, that's old news. Everybody knows that that happens in churches, in schools, wherever. I had this dream. And so remember, God gives us a word. He speaks to his children in dreams and visions, and he does that today. It's a promise of the Holy Spirit that he's going to pour out on his, on his children, men and women and children. And in this dream, I was sitting at my work, and my work, if regardless of whatever it is, it's a heavily guarded place. I work for the federal government, which is inside of a military base. So to get into that place where I work is extremely hard, right? So the thing is, is that for somebody to get in there, they really had to find some breaches, really had to get past the system. So I'm sitting inside, in, inside this building, and actually Mitchell's sitting across the way from me. And we're sitting there, and this active shooter comes in. And I still remember what he looked like, but all he had was a solid black tactical shotgun. And he came inside the building, and Mitchell had his back to him, and I was sitting in front of Mitchell, and we were the first two to encounter the active shooter. And as the active shooter comes in, the first thing he does is he runs upon Mitchell, and he puts his barrel right in the side of Mitchell's temple, and immediately pulls the trigger. And as soon as he pulls the trigger, the gun sounds like a dry fire, and it jams. So it doesn't shoot. At that very moment, I, I charge the shooter and I grab his gun. I take him to the ground and I put him in a rear naked choke and put him to sleep. And after I put him to sleep, I grab him by his neck and I drag him out into this hallway and I start calling because we have the CIAs on site and we have all of these guys called the police. I'm like, and there's a man named Issa and he's the project manager for this security task force. And I'm like, Issa, we got an active shooter. And so they wrap, they take him, they cuff him up and they start pulling him out. Well, right after this, I ended up being inside this room with everybody that I work with, kind of like this, a big conference room. And there's an, oh, what, yeah, hero, you stopped the active shooter, and you, you stopped the gunman, and, and such a great job. And, and I remember sitting there with them, and before I even began to speak, I remembered something in my dream. It's funny, because some of you guys have heard, um, so this last week was the seventh time that I've gotten reprimanded. Now, this time it's a legal and formal complaint by three people about sharing Christ at work. So this is the seventh time I've gotten in trouble. But I'm not, I'm, I'm no stranger to, to, to persecution in the workplace. I've been fired once, I've been suspended once. I've now seven times at NASA. They've sat down with me and they have read me my rights type of thing. Said, hey, this is what's going on, this is what it is. But I'm so thankful that I have a body of believers that's there yeah. that covers me in prayer. And God, we have a job to do, so I didn't apply there, didn't know anybody there. God gave me the job, so I'm working for him there. And I'm not concerned about losing my job or my money. There you go. So the point is, is that I remembered in my dream that this just happened. I just got my formal write-up. I just got my formal thing and went to legal. And I was sitting there, and I remember all the people who, even those that had turned me in for sharing Christ, even those who even claimed to be believers turned me in. And I was sitting in my dream, and I remember to plead with the people and said, guys, I remember pleading with them to repent of their sins and to believe in the Lord Jesus so that they might be saved because today could be the day. And I remember I was pleading with them with many tears. And I'm like, man, my brother could have died today. My brother Mitchell could have died today. And they're like, no, 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 that happens all the time. I was like, no, it doesn't. I said, you're going to die and you're going to stand before a creator. What are you going to do? And I remember pleading with many tears. And at that moment, Mitchell was there with me and Mitchell said, I'm not ready to meet the Lord. I'm not ready to meet Jesus. If I die today, I'm not ready to stand in judgment. I'm not ready. Whether he is or not, that's between him and the Lord. I'm just telling you what happened in my dream. But I remember sitting in that place, and I'm like, man, but with many tears, they took the pleading lightly. They didn't hear it. Many do not realize or understand their need for Christ. They don't. If you were to go out in the world today and tell somebody that Jesus loves them, most of their response would say, oh, that's great, that's good to hear, I love me too. We live in a place where people love themselves and they've made themselves their own gods. And so because they made themselves their own gods, when somebody tells them that somebody else loves them, it's only another notch on their belt. Somebody else loves me, add them to the list. But they don't have a realization of why or understanding their need for Christ. And many have been taught from false church to false church, from false teaching to false teaching, that if you want an abundant life, if you want more riches, if you want more stuff, if you want better principles, better morals, if you want your best life now, then come to Jesus. 
And that's the foundation of what a lot of the gospel in America is taught on and preached on. Jesus didn't come to save us from poverty or the middle class. Did you hear me? Amen. Amen. I heard a pastor of a 50,000 member church say, if we're not blessed, if we don't have money, if we're not rich, how can we be a blessing to other people? And how are we supposed to look like the children of God broke? Interesting. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't have a place to lay his head. Mm -hmm. The apostles, most of them, spent half their time in prison. They hardly had any money. As a matter of fact, the one who wrote 13 books, almost half of them from prison, was able to bless even until this very day. So Jesus didn't save mankind to keep them from, from poverty. Matter of fact, Jesus says, if you want to follow me, get rid of everything that you have, pick up your cross and follow me. So he didn't come to save us from poverty or middle class or to make bad people good. Jesus saved us from our sin and the coming fierce anger and wrath of Almighty God. That's what he saved us from. When somebody, I hear it all the time, hey, hey, do you know Jesus? Yeah, I'm saved from what? I'm saved, I'm saved. From what? Well, I got a good job and I got... No, what are you saved from? What did the Lord keep you from? What did he keep you away from? What's going to happen? Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead men live. Amen. Amen. People who were dead in their sins, he brought them to life. Amen. I need water. I'm already getting excited. <laughs> That's why I have to read James 3 first. Guys, I want you to know that there's no one on this planet who will escape the death and escape judgment before God. Not one. And we will all give an account of the good and the bad. Did you know that? Yeah. Even as Christians. I had a lady in the in one time sharing Christ inside of a gas station, Chevron gas station. She says, oh, no, 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 you got it wrong. We as Christians won't stand before God in judgment. Yeah. Yes, you will. Would you please turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5? If there's one thing that I've been praying for all day, yesterday, <coughs> late last night, is that you would see your need for the Son of God more than you ever have before. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you there? Mm -hmm. Verse 10, For we must all, say all, all. all, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to what he has done, whether it's good or bad. So we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And look at verse 11. Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. So because all will stand before God in judgment, we, knowing the terror of God, go out to persuade men. Of what? The terror of the Lord. Look at Hebrews chapter 9. Please turn there. A couple over to the right, right after the book of... Um, we just find Newman. Titus by Lehman, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. <laughs> Hebrews 9, 27, we okay? Mm -hmm. Hebrews 9, 27. And it is as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Nobody would deny that every one of us is at lightning speed moving for death. Every day you die, and you die, and you die, and you die, and one day it's over for you. Now, whether your age kills you or not, you're not promised tomorrow. But as it is appointed unto everyone to die, everyone shall also come before the judgment seat of God. In the book of Ecclesiastes, please listen and don't turn here, don't turn there. Ecclesiastes 3.17 says, I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. 
So guys, I want you to know something. We shall kneel in this judge's courtroom. There's no need of a defense attorney, nor a jury. Our God knows all things, all secrets, all lies, all hidden things, all dark things, every deed and every word. There's not an attorney on the earth that could stand in the presence of God and defend you. Did you catch it when it says all secrets? Mm -hmm. All hidden things? Guys, you can fool the church and the church people all day long, but God knows what's in your house. God knows what's in that room that you don't let anybody go into. And when it says every word, did you guys know that Jesus says that every word that man shall speak, they shall give an account of? Did you know that? So by your word you shall be justified, or by your word you shall be condemned? How many of you would be terrified if the Lord took the last seven days and said, you're going to give an account for this last seven days? How many of you would be in trouble? The last seven days of your speech, God's got it all written down in a book. But in this courtroom, God knows all things. And you will not be able to slip anything past this judge. And all his judgments are final. There's no court of appeal after it. When the judgment's done, the judgment's done. You can't say a thousand years later, uh, Judge, I'd like to make an appeal. There's no appeals in this courtroom. In Hebrews 4.13 it says, There's no creature that is not seen in his sight, but all things are naked and open to his eyes, of whom we must give an account. The purpose of that statement is, that God can see all things is for you to understand the one that you will give an account to can see everything there is to see about you. Yeah. Everything is naked and open, it says, to his eyes, of whom we must give an account. Amen? Amen. Amen. When many hear of the judgment of God, they immediately excuse themselves because they believe themselves to be good or they believe themselves to have done many good works. When you go out into the street, maybe not in this church, but when you go out into the streets and you're sharing Christ, which there's a lot of us who do that often. Yes. And we meet a lot of good people who are good people. Hey man, do you know about Jesus Christ? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't really need him though. I'm good. I'm okay. You know, I haven't done anything bad. I'm not killing anybody. I, didn't, I haven't been to jail. I haven't smoked dope. I haven't got drunk in alcohol, but you know. So the thing is, is that when people hear of the judgment of God, they immediately put up a block and say, not me, I'm good. That's what they do. People, do, I've done that. You've done that. I, I, well, no, I, I can't be in that same area, as you see, because, because I've, I've done a lot of good things and, and I've done enough good work. Some of you guys were here for last Saturday's message. Some of you were ministering to the people out here in this parking lot who told us that they've done enough humanitarian works that God should be pleased with it, and God should let them in. Mm -hmm. I had some people out at the Love's Truck Stop, what was that, Tuesday night? Love's Truck Stop at Tuesday night, preaching the gospel, and I had uh, all these kids from, from Tashby High School, and they're all there and says, oh man, my mom, my, my grandma, man, she loves Jesus and she prays all the time, and I said, I didn't ask about your grandma. <laughs> Sounds like she knows Jesus, but do you know Jesus? Well, my grandma knows Jesus. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So, and then here's my question. So, when you stand before God in His righteousness and, and you're on your face, is God going to let you in because you know your grandma? Mm -hmm. He's like, yeah. yeah. Wrong. <laughs> There's nobody that can get you into the gates but Jesus alone. Amen. Amen. But let's keep going. Again, many will keep themselves out and say, well, no, 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 I, I'm good. I, I've done enough good works. Well, Romans 3.10 says, it is written... There is none righteous, no, not one. So I always have to question people. So are you saying that you're righteous? Is the word of God wrong? There is none righteous, Romans 3.10 says. No, not one. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. Oh, I never sinned, man. I never did all that stuff. I stayed out of it. Wrong. Isaiah 64, 6 says, We are all as an unclean thing. Our righteousness are like filthy rags, and we do all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. I'm not trying to get gross on you, but when it's talking about 
Your righteous works, your righteous deeds, all the works that you've done are like filthy rags. It means like a tampon. Look it up. That's gross to a guy. Maybe not to a girl. But like, to a guy that's like, no. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. But they're like filthy rags to God. Did you guys know that God will judge the earth in righteousness, the Bible says? But did you know that God is going to judge the earth by His Word? You guys want to know what the judgment's going to look like? Read this. It's all here. Amen? Amen. And those that are found guilty, now listen to me. Those that are found guilty in this judge's courtroom. Guilty of what? Of sin. In this judge's courtroom shall suffer eternal torment with the devil and his angels in the lake of fire. Because death and hell, the Bible says, get cast into the lake of fire. It's the lake of fire you should be concerned with. The fire is never, it says, so it's a place where the fire is never quenched and the worm does not die, according to Isaiah 66, 24. It's a place of everlasting punishment, according to Matthew 25, 46. It's a place where those wicked who die in their sin and worship the beast in his image will drink of the wine of God's wrath and be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the Lamb and his holy angels. See, people will say, we're going to be separate from God and God will completely remove himself from us. But Revelation 14, 10 says, you shall be tormented in the presence of the Lamb and all His holy angels. Who's the Lamb? Jesus. Jesus. So, again, you will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the Lamb and the, His holy angels, where the smoke of their torment arises forever, and there is no rest there, day nor night. There's no resting. There's torment. And their smoke rises day and night. There's no rest there according to Revelations 14, 9 through 11 and Revelations 20, verse 10. This lake of fire is a place where those who were not found in the book of life will go. And those that die in their sins, neglecting such great salvation, those that trample underfoot the blood of God's Son, calling it an unholy thing, according to Revelations 20, 15, Revelations 21, 8, and Hebrews 10, 28 through 30. And I have all of those just in case I went too fast and God... Praise the Lord, we got it on video. If we need to go back and look at these verses. But God will judge the earth in righteousness. You see, that's where the scripture says, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. When a Jehovah's Witness knocks on my door and you tell me I'm just going to go to sleep, I need a nap, I'm worn out. There is judgment, there is punishment. Church, don't be deceived. And Hebrews 10.31 says, It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Amen? Amen. For our God is a consuming fire, according to Hebrews 12.29. Amen? Amen? Would you guys please turn to Isaiah 66? Let's hear some more of the word. And I wrote this down because I have a lot to go through. Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66, verse 15. Listen to this. Knowing terror of God. Listen. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. Who wants to come under the fire of God's wrath? Guys, sin separates us from God according to Isaiah 59 verse 2. Sin separates us from God, and we are all unholy, and He alone is holy. And because of our sin, we are not allowed in His presence. You're not allowed there. But what is sin, you may ask? Well, according to 1 John 3, 4, sin is the breaking of God's law. That's what sin is. 
That's what sin is defined as. See, people will say, well, I haven't really harmed anybody. I know I lied. I told a white lie or a blue lie or a yellow lie. I know that I did this and I did that, but it was no big deal. I didn't listen to my parents, but you know, it's okay. It's not that you've been, you've wronged somebody. It's that you sinned against God. Notice in Psalms 51, David says, I've sinned against you and you alone. It's you. It's your law. I've broken your law. Please don't excuse in this moment as we go through God's law right now. Please, all of you, don't excuse yourself, but examine yourself according to the law of God right now. Yeah. Are you innocent or guilty? Your eternal life depends on this. Guys, your life is a vapor. That's right. It's here today and gone tomorrow. I know I haven't lived as long as some of you guys have, but I want you to know death has no favoritism. It shows no favorites. One of these times, let's all as a church, let's go across the street over here and let's go to the cemetery and let's go from stone to stone to stone to stone and let's see if we could find some ratio of when everybody was dying. You ain't going to find it. You'll find one-year-olds there, newborns there, two-year-olds there, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds. You'll find 60-year-old, 103-year-old. You'll find any type of age range. You'll find everybody there. Your life is a vapor. I heard an old pastor say it like this. He said, it's like a tea kettle that's, that's spitting out because it's ready to go and you go to grab a handful of it and it's gone. Your life is a vapor. <clears throat> and it's here today and gone tomorrow. And tomorrow is not promised. In Psalms 90 verse 12, David says, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may know wisdom. Why would it be beneficial to number our days? Because we would take advantage of the time we have and not play games. And then in Psalms 39.4, David says, Let me know the end of my days, how frail I am. David's saying, God, let me know how fragile I am. We're not Superman. We're not. We're not superheroes. Guess what? Every one of you is going to die. Every one of you, including me. And David seeking the Lord saying, God, would you just let me like, let me retract back? Why? Because David was a mighty man of God. And I'm sure at times he probably got boasted up. He got lifted up saying, man, I'm a mighty warrior. I've killed tens of thousands, more than Saul, right? And could you imagine being in that place where he's at? To know, God, would you please let me know how fragile I am? Let me know how fragile I am. So that I may know how to count to number my days. So I won't waste time and play games. Let's look at God's law. Let's look at the Ten Commandments. I'm going to go through them, but I'm, I pulled them from Exodus 20, verses 3 through 17. But listen to this. Examine yourself right now, please. Please, keep your eyes on the law of God right now. First commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Have any of you ever broken that one? Have you put money before God? Job before God? Your house before God? Your car before God? Your family before God? Commandment number two. You shall make no graven images. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For our God is a jealous God. You ever bow down and worship something other than God? Mm. Commandment number three. You shall not use the name of God in vain. Anybody ever done that? Use the Lord's name as a curse word? We all have. Maybe not some of the younger ones that don't understand what that is, but we all have. I know that I have personally. Commandment number four. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Anybody ever broken that one before? Commandment number five, honor your father and your mother. Who's broken that one? All of us. Commandment number six, you shall not kill. Anybody ever committed murder before? You said, no, no, I never, I, no, 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 I didn't commit murder. Well, let's look what Jesus said. Jesus says, if you're angry with your brother without a cause, you've committed murder. You've committed murder. Also, so murder can be hatred. Murder can be physically killing somebody. What about aborting babies in the womb? Murder. 
That's murder, and that's wrong. And God says he does not take kindly to those who shed innocent blood. That baby's body was formed before he ever was. Amen? Amen. 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 Commandment number seven, you shall not commit adultery. Anybody ever done that one? You say, no, 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 I've never cheated on my wife. Come on, man. Well, actually, as a matter of fact, the Bible talks about adultery as either remarriage after divorce. It talks about divorcing for the wrong cause other than sexual immorality. It talks about obviously sleeping with somebody who's not your wife or not your husband. And it also talks about looking at somebody with lust. You committed adultery already in your heart. Who's done that? Thank you, Lord. Commandment number eight, you shall not steal. Anybody ever stolen anything? Commandment number nine, you shall not bar bear false witness against your neighbor. Anybody ever lied before? Dang, only four liars in this whole church. Son of a gun. You know what, guys? We need to scratch that one. We've got that one big one. Right? Commandment number 10, you shall not covet, and that's coveting your neighbor's stuff, your neighbor's house, his cars, his wife, handmaiden, anything. Has anybody ever coveted or envied somebody else's stuff? The unrighteous, listen to this, the unrighteous, the sexually immoral. Now, I must make this very clear. The sexually immoral, fornicators, people who have having sex and they're not married, pedophiles, homosexuals. This whole LGBTQ question mark slash slash hyphen whole thing, sin. All sexual immorality, pornography. All sexual immorality. So the unrighteous, the sexually immoral, the idolaters, the effeminate. And effeminate means those who are men that have female qualities. What about men dressing up like women? It's an abomination. Read Deuteronomy. I believe it's chapter 5. The effeminate, the, those that covet, drunkards, revelers, verbal abusers, extortioners, those that are lascivious, it means filthy, disgusting lewdness. Witchcraft, anybody that practices that, divination of any kind is an abomination. Murder, hatred, strife, heresies, those that cause division or seditions, emulations, trying to excel others, pride, what about pride? To have pride is to boast. Is to boast in something other than God. I'm proud of this. I'm proud of that. And it makes you act in a way that's not right. I've been prideful in my life. For example, I've been prideful over my bank account in times past. I've been prideful over the females that I got with. I've been prideful over the t how well I did in sports. I've been prideful because I went to Kansas. I've been prideful because I blah, 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 blah. We boast in nothing but the Lord Jesus Christ. Pride itself is a sin. And what, is, what happens before pride? A fall. And just a real fast thing, on the whole God's word compared to the world, pride comes before a fall. If the whole focus of your agenda is pride, it's not looking good for you. Amen. And I'm talking about gay pride. Don't worry. I don't mind getting beat up after Sermon, just let me finish. I got your back. All right, thanks, Brother Martin. Well, I'm fresh, man. The Lord, the Lord set up David with mighty men. I got mighty men, too, see? Right. So pride, evil desires, malicious, that's evil intent, gossipers, any gossipers in here? I like to gossip about other people behind their back when they're not here. Haters of God, boasters, covenant breakers, those that are bitter, those that are unforgiving, etc., etc., etc. If you read through the scriptures, you'll find the law of God. There are many, many more. And what I've pulled for you today is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Galatians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, Colossians chapter 3, Romans chapter 1, and Revelations 21, 8. Listen to this. But the fearful, that means a coward, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Amen?
Amen. In Psalms 5, 5, listen to this before, so that we don't miss this because these verses aren't read a lot in church. Psalms 5, 5, God says he hates all those who practice sin. Nobody's heard that one before? Mm-hmm. Psalms 5, 5, he hates all workers of iniquity. What about Psalms 7, 11, which says that God is angry with the wicked every day? Did you guys know that one? Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. And I'll get to the end later. But the wages, the cost of sin is death. In that great day of God's wrath, where do you stand? Innocent or guilty? Heaven or the lake of fire? If we just went through the law of God... And I'm not asking you to jump up and shout. And there's a good ending to this story. The point is, is that you need to see your need of Christ. He didn't just save you so you can come sit in a pew for 20 years. He didn't just save you so that you can come and say, well, I got religion. Now I'm going to go do everything else in my life. Where do you stand? Don't leave the big parts coming. Brother Patrick's out. Let's skip that. <laughs> do you see your sin? All of you. Here in the law of God, do you see your sin? Because I want you to know something right now. Everything that I'm giving you, I'm giving you a verse behind it. I'm giving you a verse. Let God be true and every man a liar. Romans 3, 4. You got an issue with God's word? Then take it up with him. I'm just going to regurgitate what I see and what I read. Amen? Amen. Amen. But do you see your sins? And does God's holy word convict your soul? Do you tremble at God's word? In Psalms 19.7, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. You know why I say amen to that? Because it's a mirror to show you how wicked you are, how wicked I am. And it shows me where I've broken God's law. It shows me the mess that I've made of myself. To know that I'm not okay where I stand. And I'm not okay just going to church. I'm not okay with just having lifeless religion. I'm not okay just because I go to a Bible study. I'm not okay. I look into the mirror of the God's law and I see I'm flawed. I'm guilty. I'm stained. And then we cry out things like, who can save us from this body of death? Who cried that? Paul did. Who can save me from this body of death? We can't save ourselves. We need a Savior. We have no hope. We're destined for torment. We're appointed to God's wrath. What are we going to do? Guys, the reason why... Give me some more water. Hold on. The reason why tonight's message was titled The Love of the Judgment of God and the Love of God. Because it's what Jesus told us to preach. Luke eleven forty two, Jesus says, Woe to you, Pharisees, you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs, but you pass over the judgment and love of God, and these ought you to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Yeah, yeah I can bring him a pastor, and he can come sit up here and tell you about the best. 30 ways to tithe and do all this other stuff and how to increase your bank account and how God's going to bless you and how I can sell this holy anointing oil and you can anoint your billfold with it and you'll find money in it in three weeks from now. I can tell you about how um, any other way, let's be prosperous. Let's, no, no. God says, listen, this is your problem, you hypocrite. You should have been bringing the judgment of God and the love of God. Listen, we can stick on the love of God. I love the love of God more than the judgment of God, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but the judgment of God makes me understand the love of God. That's right. right. I need that. Luke 11, 42. Again, you you hypocrites. What do they say? You play actors? You play actors? He says you pass over judgment and the love of God. (laughs) You just pass over. You don't even preach about it. Do you guys know when the Holy Spirit's in a place, sin, righteousness, and judgment will be preached? Do you know that's the Holy Spirit's job? That's his, that's his MO. You guys ever read that about the Spirit? Mm-hmm. Sin, righteousness, judgment. That's what the Holy Spirit brings. You go into a place and you hear nothing about sin. 
hear nothing about righteousness and hear nothing about judgment, there's a good chance the Holy Spirit's not there, even though people are falling all over the floor having seizures. Let the word of God be true and every man a liar. I've brought to you the judgment of God and I pray you guys were smacked down to reality. To know where you stand. And I know this is not to question you and your salvation and you, the love of God and nothing like that. This is for you to understand your need for Jesus Christ. Because how do you rate right now in God's sight? If we stop right there, if I say, hey guys, great time, thanks for coming, we'll see you next Saturday, and I walk off the plane. I heard of a man preaching one time for 28 days straight, never called one time an altar call. Not one time. 28 days he preached, and I believe he's the one that wrote uh, Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God. Sinners in the hand of an angry God. And he preached 28 days straight. The judgment of God. 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 And then he preached the love of God. And the whole place fell out. Because they needed it. They saw their need for him. And he left night after night after night after night. For an old pastor said, you can't, this ain't no cruise through car wash. Just come up, repent, say your things, and get saved in five minutes. He says it's like going out to a field to farm, to sow crop, to sow seed. And he says all of a sudden you expect you're going to get a whole harvest in ten minutes. Mm. But I brought to you the judgment of God. But now hear the love of God that shows you your necessity of Jesus Christ. And as we stand here weighted down by our sin, by our shame, by our broken hearts, my question to you, are you that are weary? Are you ready for some good news? Amen. No, maybe not. You just want to keep your sin. That's cool. You can keep that burden. Right. Are you ready for some good news? Yes. Amen. Good news. You know what that's what gospel means? Yes. It means good news. It means good news. News. I want to tell you guys right now that before the earth was ever formed, before the first sin was ever committed, God had a plan. God had a plan. God loves us so much that he did not desire to punish us nor to appoint us to the lake of fire. So for almost 2,000 years, so almost 2,000 years ago, forgive me, when we were separated from God, we broke God's law, we spit in his face, we blasphemed his holy name, God sent his son Jesus to this earth born of a virgin lived a sinless life for 33 years fulfilling the law and its requirements and willingly laid his life by sacrifice down in our place when john the baptist sees him for the first time in john chapter 1 verse 29 he says behold the lamb of god that takes away the sins of the world Amen. that's him Amen. that's him so Jesus lays his life down in our place, took upon himself our judgment, our sin, our shame, and the wrath of the Father, and was crucified, buried, and three days later, he arose from the grave, paying our debt in full, Amen. and restoring us back to the Father in true relationship, no longer guilty. No longer separated from God, but forgiven of all sin and removed from God's anger and wrath. And to all those that repent of their sins and believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior shall be saved and receive eternal life. See, while we were sitting there in the last video, listen guys, that guy that was on that video, I'm going to tell you right now, that wasn't Jesus. That was an actor, right? Mm -hmm. Jim, because... Cabezel or Cazibel or whatever. That wasn't Jesus. And that motion picture couldn't come close to what Jesus had to endure for our sin. That's right. Do you understand that? Yes. Listen, sometimes we get this idea. We're just like, man, God just, it's all grace, it's all grace. God just doesn't care. If God didn't care about your sin, then why did Jesus have to die such a death? Yeah. And every time we think that God's okay with our sin, remember the cross. Because it was the cost of this, not this, but a piece of wood that God would redeem his people. In John 
Do I even have to turn there? Come on. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall receive everlasting life. Why did God send his son? Why? For God so loved the world. He loves the world. So he sent his own son. That if you just believe in him, he says you'll receive everlasting life. Because he's the one that would make you right before him. Amen. Do you know what verse 17 says? God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God doesn't want to condemn you. His law is brought forth and the law is perfect, converts the soul. Because you see your need of Christ. You see it. But he didn't send his son to condemn you. He sent his son to save you from himself. From his own wrath. Amen. God loved us before we ever loved him. In John 3.36, at the getting close to the end of that chapter, it says, Whosoever believes in the Son has everlasting life. Whosoever does not believe on the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. You see, what did Jesus save us from? Why do we need Jesus? We need Jesus not only to forgive us from, of our sins, but we need Jesus to remove the wrath of the Father from off our heads. Yes. And those who don't accept the Son, they're condemned. Why? Because they have rejected God's own Son. They have rejected the Word, God's own testimony that He sent His own Son. They've rejected that. And if you don't believe in the Son, then the wrath of God is waiting to crush you. Would you please turn to Isaiah 53? Some more good news. You should be in Isaiah 66, so just be a couple chapters back. Praise the Lord. Amen. I've heard it say, plus or minus 700 years, Isaiah 53 was written before Christ ever walked the earth. 700 years. Prophecy. Isaiah 53, starting in verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him, and he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs, he has carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded. That word wounded, defined in the original Hebrew, is pierced. Look it up. I was amazed when I read that for the first time. That word wounded, so he was pierced for our transgressions. And that word transgression means rebellion or sin. So he was wounded. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord took your debt. The Lord took my debt. And laid it on his own son. Verse 7, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, he didn't open his mouth. When all the people came against Jesus, look at this prophecy. When all the people came against Jesus, and they falsely accused him, and falsely accused him, and falsely accused him, what did he say back? No, nothing. Nothing. He was silent. He was silent. Wow. Jesus fulfilled that to perfection. Verse 8, he was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people was he stricken. For your rebellion and mine, Jesus was stricken. 
And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased, listen to this, please, it pleased the Lord to crush him, and when he has put him to grief, when you shall make his soul an offering for sin. That word bruise is defined as crush. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. It pleased God to crush his own son when he would make him an offering for us. Why? Because when Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane, there's one thing that he asked to be removed from him, and it wasn't the cross. It wasn't the scourging from the flagellum or the cat of nine tails. It wasn't the spitting in the face. It wasn't the punching. It wasn't the bag over the head. It wasn't the beating. He asked, Father, if it be possible, would you remove this cup from me? Guys, in the, in the book of Revelations, it says that these people who go in the lake of fire, they're going to drink down the wrath, the wine of the wrath of God. That cup of wrath that Jesus was about to gulp down in our place. He says, Father, if there's any other way, but if not, let your will be done. So Jesus drank the wrath, the anger, the fierce anger of God that was meant for you and me, and he took it upon himself. And he laid upon a piece of wood. And he finished it. He took it all. He paid it all. He left nothing back. Jesus is the Son of God. And at any moment, he could have jumped down like he told Peter. Don't you realize I could have called 12 legions of angels right now? And they could have showed up. This fight would have been over in 0.5 seconds. Come on. Jesus could have said, you know what? Skip this. I'm out. Jumps off that cross and destroys everybody. But for our sake, he willingly gave up his life so that we may have life. The Bible says he became sin who knew no sin so that we may become the righteousness of God in him. Amen. 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 It pleased God to crush him because God had to let out all anger and all wrath so that he wouldn't give you any of it. In the book of Acts 2, would you please turn there? Acts chapter 2. Thank you, Lord. The book of Acts, chapter 2. When Jesus, or forgive me, when Peter preached his first message, when he preached his first message, he's standing before this multitude of people who end up 3,000 that day get saved. Peter's preaching this message in Acts 2, verse 37. It says, now when they heard this, now they were preaching how you crucified the Son of God. It was you guys that threw him on the cross, right? Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. They were convicted, right? And they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What will we do with this guilt? What will we do with this shame? Then Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission or forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this promise is to you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Amen? Amen. In Acts 4.12 it says, There is no salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. There's only one name that brings forth salvation. There's only one name. There's only one Son of God. There's only one God in the flesh that put Himself upon the cross for our sake. Amen? And His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. And in Romans chapter 5, turn there please. It's the next book over. Romans chapter 5. Come on, let's hear about the love of God. Amen? Amen. Romans chapter 5. Everybody's getting excited. A little weighty earlier, but now the Lord's pumping it up now. <laughs> Romans chapter 5. Are we there? Amen. Verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We are justified by faith in Jesus and we have peace with God now. 
God's not angry with us anymore. We have peace because of Jesus Christ. And then look at verse 6. Look at verse 6, church. For when you were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. All those people who just heard the law of God, who heard the word of God, who heard, got convicted about what the word says, about what sin is. When you were without strength and in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 7 says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God, now listen, you have to understand verse 7 because he's making a statement here. He says, Christ died for the ungodly, but listen, scarcely for a righteous man one would die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare. So look at this, a righteous man, yeah, they might die for him. A good man, no way. Where does that leave an evil man? Where does that leave an evil woman? Does, does he or she have any hope? No. But God commends, proves his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen? Amen. Much more now. Listen to this. Verse 9. Much more now. Much more then. Forgive me. Being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And when you ask, what are you saved from? I'm, I'm, I'm saved, you know, I go to church now. No, no, what? God didn't save you to give up an hour of your time. God saved you from what? Amen. From sin and the wrath of Almighty Father. Amen? Amen. In the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, it says, Jesus delivered us from the coming wrath. In the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 9 through 10, it says, God has not appointed us to wrath. Did you hear me? God has not appointed you to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So whether we're dead or alive, he says, we shall live together with him. God has not. That's the gospel right there. God has not appointed you to wrath, but instead, instead, he wants you to have eternal life. And that life through his son, so that whether you're alive or you're dead, you'll live forever with him. Amen? Almost done. John 14, 6. Anybody know that one? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So what's the only way to eternal life? Through Jesus Christ. Is there another way? Is there any other name? No. In Hebrews 7, 25, it says that God is able to save them or us to the uttermost that go to the Father through the Son. God is able to save you to the uttermost, to make you new, to, to the end of completion. To, God is able, it says, to make us, to save us to the uttermost. The only way to forgiveness, the only way to be removed from God's wrath, to be born again, is through Jesus Christ alone. I'm not preaching the wilderness church up here. I'm not preaching some man's doctrine up here. It's Jesus Christ. This church can't save you. There's not a person in this house that can save you. The only one that can save you is Jesus Christ. And forgive me, Lord, because he says, when two or three are gathered in my name, I am there. And it's about him in this place. Amen? Amen. It's not about us. We worship the Lord, our King. Amen? Amen? No king but King Jesus. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2, please. A couple books over. You guys getting, you guys getting tired of me yet? No. no. no you guys doing all right? Okay. I'm going to get that glass of water. <laughs> oh, I got some right here. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And you, has he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Amen? Amen. Wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Who's that? Satan. 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 The spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. That's what we were. But God, there's another but God. Here he comes again. Here's what you deserve, but God, 
who is rich in mercy. For his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in our sin, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you are saved. And has raised us up together, it says, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show. To show something means to, to prove evidence, to provide evidence for something. He wants to show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. Amen. How did God prove his kindness? By sending his son, and his son would take on a debt that wasn't his. It was mine. What kindness, what riches of grace. And then he says in verse 8, For by grace you are saved through faith. It's not yourself. It is the gift of God. Amen. Not of works, lest someone should boast. And just like we had the conversation with that young man outside this window right here, at the end, he's not here, forgive me. But last weekend when we were standing out there, just like we had a conversation with him, he says, you know, man, I've done enough humanitarian work. I've done this. I've done that. Listen, if Abraham can't boast, if David can't boast, if Peter can't boast, if Paul can't boast, you ain't going to boast. Because we were saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was his will. It was his power. Not ours. Yes, God gives us free will. We had to choose him. But understand this. You have no ability to save yourself because God would accept no sacrifice from you. Yes, Amen. In Lamentations, let's, let's turn there. What do you guys think about Lamentations? Now, matter of fact, listen. I already got it. Listen to this, guys. Lamentations chapter 3. You guys may have heard the seen this on Facebook or seen it all. Listen. Lamentations 3 verse 21. It says, This I recall to my mind, therefore I have I hope. He says, I'm going to remember this so I can keep hope. He says, it is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed because of his compassions. They do not fail. It is the Lord's mercy why we are not consumed. And it says, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Amen. Amen. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. And the Lord is good to them that wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. Verse 26, it is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. <laughs> Amen? But Amen. it is of the Lord's mercies why we are not consumed, because His compassions do not fail. Amen? Amen. 2 Peter 3, nine. So we know it's God's grace that saved us. Now we heard it's God's mercy that saved us. In 2 Peter 3.9, in regards to Jesus' second coming, Paul says, or forgive me, Peter. Peter says in 2 Peter 3.9, he says God's not lazy concerning His promise to return. That's right. But He's patient. With all mankind, giving everyone the opportunity to repent of their sins. Amen. He's been patient with you. Now you, you've, heard the, you've heard the law of the Lord. You see your need for Jesus. How many of you, ten years ago, Jesus should have crushed you, smashed you into power, and sent you back into the lake? Right here. All day, every day. That's what I deserve. But God didn't give me what I deserve. That's grace. Amen. He didn't give me what I deserve. But listen to that. God has been patient with you. He's been patient with me. God watched me live like a devil for 21 years. And he still gave me a chance. He gave me an opportunity. So now I boast and I glory in Jesus because I'm like, God, you are so good. You are so patient with me. Wow. But it's the patience of God that leads us to repentance. That's what 2 Peter 3.15 says. It's God's patience that's our salvation. It's God's patience that's our salvation. So it's, the, it's God's grace that saved us. It's His mercy. It's His patience. In Romans 6.23, the end of that verse, we read the first part, right? The wages of sin is death. But what does the second say? But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Yes, what you deserve, the wages of sin, is you deserve to die. But the gift of God is eternal life. Here you go. Free to you, cost Him everything. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Look at what God has done for us. Guys, in Romans 2, 4, it says this. Do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that it's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance? Did you hear that? It's the goodness of God, it's the forbearance of God, and it's the longsuffering of God. Let's define all three, shall we? The goodness of God is defined as his kindness. 
The forbearance of God is defined as his delay of punishment or restraint of punishment. And the long suffering is his patience. So it's God's kindness, it's his delay of punishment, and it's his patience that leads us to repentance. Amen. Can you believe that? When you realize, God, I'm so sinful and wicked, and you've been kind with me? You delayed your coming. You delayed my punishment because you're patient with me? You've given me chance. You've given me opportunity to repent. Are you kidding me? I must repent. I, look at this. Look at what he's done. In Luke 5.32, it says Jesus came to call sinners to repentance. That was his job. That's what he came to do. In 2 Corinthians 6.2, it says today is the day of salvation. Today. And in John 6.37, Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, he says, I shall in no wise cast away. Did you hear that? Whoever goes to Jesus... He says, I'm not going to cast you out. All you got to do is come. Oh, well, i got to go get fixed up first, and i got to go to church a few times, and then I can start calling. No, come. Yep. You may not have next week. Yep. You may not have two weeks from now. Knowing the terror of the Lord, we must persuade you. Go now. Don't waste any more time. This may be the last day for me. This may be the last day for you. And in God's love and his kindness and his delay of punishment and his patience, he's drawing you and drawing you and drawing you. Quit playing games. Because you have no excuse when you stand before God why you never came. Why you never came. 1 John 1, nine says, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And of all unrighteousness, all we have to do is come to Him. You don't confess before a priest or a pope or some other dude. You go to Jesus. You confess before Him, and He will hear you and forgive you. Guys, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, chapter 28, verse 13, He that covers his sins shall not prosper. But whosoever confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. Do you ever hear that one? Yeah. Proverbs 28, 13. Whoever covers their sin, you will not prosper. Why? Because God sees it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. But whoever confesses and forsakes, God, I know you see me. I've heard your law. I'm pricked in my heart. What must I do? I'm going to take advantage of my time and I'm going to repent. I'm going to turn from my wicked ways and I'm going to turn after you. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Isaiah 118, God says, come, let us reason together. He says, though your sins be like scarlet, he says, I shall wash them and make them as white as snow. Ooh. God is reasoning with all of you tonight. Mm -hmm. He's reasoning with you. Come, he says, let us reason. He says, I know you see your sin. I see your sin. Though they be all red like crimson, he says, no, I'll do. Come to me. I'll wash you as white as snow. I'll wash you as white as snow. Why would we neglect such great salvation? Don't waste any more time. Christ is at hand. Let's repent and believe the gospel. Please turn with me. I got the last two you guys will have to turn to. Ezekiel 33, please. Isaiah, Jeremiah. Should be Lamentations. Yeah, Lamentations and then Ezekiel. Ezekiel 33. Now I want you to tell me, tell you something. Now, I know that tonight's message is hard. And I understand what people's beliefs are and not are. Here's the thing. My prayer tonight when I was seeking the Lord. As I said, Lord, even if they won't stand with me, will you stand with me? Just because there's going to be people in this house that doesn't like tonight's message, I'm not preaching. I'm not your servant. I'm God's. I'm accountable to Him. And if I sugarcoat, compromise, water down any of God's truth, I'm responsible for that. And God says in John, James chapter 3, Let there not be many teachers, knowing they shall receive the greater condemnation. Speaking of teachers becoming condemned by what they're teaching, Ezekiel 33. Listen to this. God's word. Thank you, Lord, for standing with me. Your word is powerful, my God. It's your word. Thank you, Jesus. 
Ezekiel 33, verse 7, So you, O son of man, I have set you a watchman to the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say to the wicked, wicked man, you will surely die. If you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, the wicked man shall die in his iniquity, and his blood will I require at your hand. Nevertheless, verse 9, if you warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, and he does not turn from his way, he will die in his sin, but you have delivered your soul. Therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Thus you speak, saying, If our transgressions and our sins be upon us and we pine away in them, how should we then live? Say to them, verse 11, As I live, saith the Lord. This is from God. Listen, we can say, Thus saith the Lord right now. Thus saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? So every day that the wicked, the unbelieving, the sinful, die in their sin, God's not pleased. I can tell you right now that God does not desire one single soul to go into the lake of fire. Not one. And I'll tell you why. Because if he did, he would have never sent his son. But he sent his son to prove his love. That even though you wanted nothing to do with him, even though you were lost and exceedingly sinful, he still died for you. He loved you before you ever loved him. Wow. So God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from their way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, but why will you die? In Isaiah, go back a couple couple books, please. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6 through 7. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Again, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. The unrighteous man, his thoughts, let him return to the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, he will abundantly pardon. <laughs> Revelations twenty two twelve. Last two verses I have here. Revelations twenty two twelve, And behold, Jesus says, I am coming quickly to give to every man according to what their work shall be. In Matthew 24, 44, Therefore Jesus says, Be ready, because in an hour as you do not think, the Son of Man comes. I'm going to tell you right now, one of two things. Either you're going to give up the ghost, you're going to die, and you're going to stand before God's presence, and you're going to give an account of your life for the good and for the bad. Or you're going to see Jesus crack open them clouds coming with all of his holy angels and you're going to see him bring down fire on this earth. The last thing that I have to say, and I saw this and I can't take any credit for this, but I saw it and I loved it and I wanted to end this way. Life is short. Death is sure. Sin, the cause. Christ, the cure. Amen. 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 Just to share one thing quickly, and just to let you know that the Lord always gets two confirmations, does he not? You can look at my phone on November 10th, I sent to Cody, that's what I said to him. I said, I had a dream last night, I think you were at work, a man was walking around with a rifle near some women's offices. 
There was a double door and some stairs. I didn't see anyone get shot. You were walking toward him, but you didn't know and turned into a different direction. Someone tried to hit the guy with a broom or something. But that was November 10th of an active shooter at us. And about two weeks later, he has a dream on that. So I'm just telling you, the Lord does give people dreams for confirmations. You know what I mean? So I sent that to him on November 10th. Oh. Wow. Was it coincidence? I don't think so. Wow. Just so you know. <laughs> the, love, the judgment of God and the love of God. Do you realize your need for Christ? Now, church, how many Bless of you. you realize your need more than ever before this day of Christ and how without Him is the lake of fire? And you want to take advantage of the time and knowing the terror of the Lord, you were persuaded tonight. You want to repent and turn from your sins and make a public profession today yes, that you're done with this sinful, wicked lifestyle and that you're ready for Christ <laughs> and that you want to live for Him all the days of your life. That you're done living for you. It's about Jesus now. That you heard the judgment of God and now you've heard the love of God and all you can do because of His his goodness, because of His forbearance, and because of His long-suffering, it's causing you to come to repentance. Let's take advantage of the patience tonight. Yeah. And the Lord says, come, all who would come. Come first. Who will join me? Anybody join me? Grandpa? Is that where you came up? Yeah. <clears throat> About uh, keep three coming. four years ago. Keep coming. Keep coming. All who will come, the Lord says come. Anybody who comes to Him, He'll never cast away. Amen. John 6, 37. All who would come to Him, the Lord never casts away. Yes, take advantage of the love of God. Do not come under the judgment of God. Amen. About three or four years ago, I broke my neck. 